So I just wanted to talk a little bit about a project I've been working on. So I call it uh, S Java. So you might see the S expressions. <laughs> so it's Java with S expressions. Uh, so you might be asking, is it a Lisp? Is it Scheme? Is it Clojure? No, no, no. It's fully static. Uh, the S expressions don't exist after you compile, right? So here we see the classic Hello World example. It's basically the same as Java's. Um, we can just run that real quick, and we get Hello World. Okay, um, now what Lisp is known for is the macros, right? And so there's no reason why we can't have compile time macros. So let's just uh, create this macro here, mac, takes in a t, and then it uh, returns the system out print ln of t. And so we can replace this with mac. And we run that, and we still get our hello world. Cool. Uh, now, this, micro, this macro system, uh, it's different than any other that I know anyways, because it's hygienic, and it gives you a lot of information about where the macro is being called from. So for example, we can add a print. So anything I type inside the macro will be run at compile time, right? So we can run a print of MI. MI stands for method information, method info. And so we'll actually see the method where the macro is being called from. So macros, what are macros? Well, a macro, I think about it as a compile time function. It takes in tokens, and it returns a token. So this is JVMLS, so I figured I'd show some bytecodes. So the macro is compiled as a static method. Uh, you can see Mac, right? It returns a S Java compiler lexparse token, and it takes in a, a bunch of stuff here. This is the method info. This is the int. Uh, that's for the hygiene. So if you have x in the macro and x outside of the macro, then they're colored differently based on this int. Uh, the handler, which is how the method is being compiled, and the lexparse token, which is the t parameter. And so th what the macro does is it creates the, the token that, uh, that you want to create uh, with a lot of bytecodes, and then it finally returns that token. And then the compiler compiles that token into the method. So the little AST, we have the block token, which is what I call the S expression, and then you have the standard stuff here, colon token with the system out, println, and the hello world. OK. so. Let's uh, change this up a bit. So let's define a, a, uh, a variable here. And so now we're going to call mac on this uh, variable. OK. So an interesting thing we can do is we can run some type inference on the tokens which are passed into the macro. So the macro is expanded as the method is being compiled. So it has access to all of the information about the method. So if we run this now, then it will tell us that it's type int. So we passed in A, the token, and it knows that it's type int. Uh, if we change this to, oops, if we change this to 3.0, it'll give us a type double. Cool. So uh, this has some fun uses. For example, if we were going to create a for each macro. So everyone knows that uh, arrays are a big wart in uh, Java, but we still have a for each, right? So if we wanted to create a for each macro, which can loop over arrays and array lists, uh, we just do a condition in the macro which checks the type of the, of the collection that you're trying to loop over. And if it's an array, we loop using the index. And if it's not an array, we create an iterator, and we loop over that way. So here, we create a for each macro, and we do the for each, either with an iterator or with the index. And if we run this, we'll see it prints 429 two times. Cool. So some other interesting things we might do. Uh, we have a with macro, right? I'm sure everyone knows with statements, maybe from uh, Visual Basic or something like that. <laughs> So we can do a similar thing here, right? So uh, println is also a macro, just a shortcut for system out println. 
So we do with array list. We're going to add all these elements. Then we get to this. Then we're going to set the first element to L. And then we're going to remove the second element. And we end up with uh, three LMN7. And if we run this, we'll see three LMN7. And of course, uh, I've, uh, it supports uh, lambdas too. So if we have uh, an array list here, or rather a list, and then we create a stream, we filter, and uh, we have lambdas. Uh, these are fake lambdas. It's uh, just anonymous classes. But uh, we, we can use the stream API, so we're going to take out everything greater than five, so we'll get the 989. And that works, too. Cool. Uh, another little example. So in Java, we don't have double dispatch, right? So either you do visitor or you do something ugly like this, where you have uh, basically a switch on the instance of checks, and then you cast it so that it goes to the right method. So the compiler is all self-hosting for SJava. So if you look. These are all of the different compile methods for the different types of tokens, right? So you have uh, a compile method for the string tokens, for the fields, for the begins, and all that. Um, and so the compiler actually uses a macro called double dispatch to generate a huge if uh, for all of these different token types. And it's able to do that because when the macro is called, it can access information about the method which it was called from and then the class which it was called from. And so it looks at all the methods which are defined in the class, and so it creates the, this big double dispatch. So that's kind of cool. You don't have to worry about every time you add a new token type to go back to the if statement. OK, so more generally, obviously, I don't expect all of you guys to start coding in SJava. <laughs> uh, even though I do like that it has S expression syntax while it's still statically typed and a good macro system. But more generally, uh, I'd like to say that the only reason I was able to make uh, a project like this was because I used uh, GNU bytecode for bytecode generation. And it offers many, many abstractions, which you just don't have in uh, ASM. The big thing is that, uh, say you're writing a compiler, so you need to, uh, for example, you need to be able to know the parameters when someone says system out print ln, you need to know that system out print ln takes a string, so that if someone doesn't give you a string, then you throw an exception, or something like that. So uh, the, the GNU bytecode will unify the representations of classes which you are creating uh, using GNU bytecode, so classes which are being generated and classes which are already generated. Um, so uh, you have these class type method field, and so you can create those for classes and fields and methods which are already created, and then it'll use the new uh, the Java Lang reflect in order to give you the same information. Um, I've been working for a while on uh, on changing new bytecode so that it actually uses ASM underneath, and so I think that will uh, make it so that we can add a lot more features to new bytecode. Uh, and whenever ASM is improved, then new bytecode will be able to be improved too. Uh, so. I think that'll be merging in soon. So just a fun little example. Uh, in ASM, if we're going to push 4242, so we're going to need to write some code which knows to pick the SI push, because we can't do a BI push with 4242. It's out of range. Uh, and then if we want to do a return, we need to remember that the last thing we pushed was of type integer, and we need to do an I return. So this is just a bunch of things which, if you're writing a compiler, you really don't want to have to think about, which instructions to pick to push an int, and then which return instruction you need. So in GNU bytecode, you just do emit push int. It'll automatically pick the best instruction, whether that's uh, LDC, BI push, SI push, whatever else. And when you do an emit return, uh, the GNU bytecode keeps track of the stack state, and so it'll know to pick the I return. And this, this is for all of GNU bytecode. And one of the things this allows GNU bytecode to do is that it'll catch all sorts of errors, which with ASM you would have only caught, say, when you were verifying the class file. 
And when you're writing a compiler, it's really good to have it crash the second that it does something that doesn't make sense. So that made debugging a whole lot easier. So yeah, overall, uh, you know, S expressions are good. And if you're creating bytecodes, you should check out the new bytecodes.